All right, I'm going to record another video in the series um, based on the class that I'm teaching right now. So again, this series is uh, introduction to some con concepts within machine learning um, for people without the background that we typically expect in sort of an intro to machine learning course. That means someone who doesn't, you know, maybe hasn't studied computing or computer science or programming or statistics, but someone who's interested in understanding how these technologies work, you know, without having to know that background. So today I'll talk about a bird's eye view of recommender systems. The, the plan is that I'm going to talk about two types of recommendation algorithms. And there's lots of ways to categorize these things. So I'm going to do one of the types of categorization. Uh, and then I'll go over some recent history, uh, although it's all the, uh, over, over uh, 10 years old now. But I will talk about the, the Netflix prizes. Um, uh, and then I'll go over one particular algorithm called the matrix factorization algorithm. That is basically the, 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 principle, the principles behind this algorithm are in use today, even though this is an old method. Uh, pretty much real recommender system algorithms use this same kind of idea in modern times. Uh, then I want to talk about feedback loops in recommendation. So there, there's some feedback loops that we have to consider that are part of how we consider the role of recommender systems in our society. And lastly, I'll talk about the problem of harmful content. So to get going, we'll talk about the two types of recommendation algorithms. So on the left, I want to talk about a method, an idea called a collaborative filtering recommendation. And it's such a, it's kind of a fancy sounding word. Um, and it's not the, I don't really like the, that this has historically become the name of this type of method. Um, so I put in parentheses interaction based. So, so right, this, the concept is recommendation algorithms can look at, you know, which objects users interact with and based on that can figure out, you know, what types of common patterns are, uh, are ones that, that, are, that where a user will interact with, you know, uh, certain items as a group. And then if another user interacts with one of the items in that group, you might predict, you might sort of estimate that that, that new user might like the item, uh, might be interested in the items, the other, the other items in the group. So in, in the example here, I have, uh, you know, an, a user interacts with items one and two. That's what the, the uh, icons are meant to draw. Um, and then another user rec interacts with items three and four. And so this new user with a question mark underneath it uh, comes in and that user interacts with item three. And so the recommendation algorithm might look at the patterns from the previous users and figure out that uh, we should recommend item four to this new user. So an important aspect here is uh, that the items have no description about them and the users have no description in this form of recommendation. You know, we just think of them as anonymous objects, you know, one, two, three, four, and people one, two, three, and they're not, you know, th th we don't know anything about them except for what they interact with. On the right, we have content-based recommendation. So that's trying to, I'm trying to illustrate here that the objects now have some semantic meaning. Uh, in this silly example, we have different types of fruit. Um, you know, tomato is technically a fruit. Um, well, I guess depending on how you categorize it. Actually, I believe I've read that that fruit and vegetables are only separated in the culinary sense. Right? Biologically, they're not really that separated. Um, anyway, okay, so uh, so we have kiwi, uh, coconut, tomato, and blue and blueberry, and we have that um, you know this this uh, student uh, is the first user. The student likes the kiwi and the coconut. The police officer likes the tomato and the and the blueberry. And we have this new user, and and the idea is that we have maybe demographic information about these people, um, and you might know where they live, for example. So maybe if the if the new this new user comes in and maybe lives in the same neighborhood as the the de the police officer, maybe you might guess that they might like the same type of fruit. And it's kind of a stretch, but let's say you do that. Um, and and then you know based on the information about the users and the items that are being recommended, you can kind of figure out what you might want to recommend to people. And in practice, we usually have a mix of the two. Um, there's no reason not to include both types of information. Um, so, so usually, you know, uh, real deployed recommender systems consider both aspects, right? Both the interactions that people have made with uh, with objects and some kind of information about the users and the items, you know, that is provided, right? That is available to the system. So, let's take this back a few years. So, in 2000. 
2009, well, 2008 actually, um, uh, Netflix released a data set that they, and they released a, a, you know, a challenge to the community of machine learning researchers, recommender system researchers. Actually, I don't even know if there was technically a recommender system research community back then, but machine learning researchers or data mining researchers to, um, to try to develop a method that would predict the ratings for that, that users would provide on Netflix um, for movies uh, based on previous ratings that they've provided. And, you know, this is, this is really interesting because this was back when Netflix was mailing out DVDs, right? So it was, um, it was not a digital streaming service as it is now, but it was, it was a, a movie rental service, right? a DVD rental service. And, and back then they had a really huge library. I, I think it might be larger than it is today because they, don't, they didn't have to acquire digital rights for the movies. So they could just sort of, any movie they could buy, they could, they could rent out. But I'm not sure about that number. I mean, may, maybe with Netflix now also producing its own movies, it has its own, maybe it has a larger library now, but I'm not so sure. Um, anyway, so, so this is a picture of the team that won and it was actually a team of teams uh, that there were there were a, a few teams that were kind of leading, leading the. They were on top of the leaderboard, and they, they combined together to combine their their software and algorithms to develop like a super uh, a super predictor that was like a you know they call it an ensemble model, but basically just averaged the predictions from all the different models. And we're going to talk about the so two of the scientists, two of the scientists here, and another scientist from uh, a few industry positions. They were. Uh, some of the leaders on this team, and I'll talk about their method. That, so that was the matrix factorization technique that we'll, we'll discuss. Um, so the thing about this this prize, this first prize that they came, that came out in you know that, where they finally gave the they um, uh, had, had this big ceremony to announce the winner um, in two thousand nine. Uh, this was the first contest that Netflix tried to do, and it was it was kind of it was really revolutionary. Right? This is like the basis behind Kaggle. Kaggle.com is a, it's a website where people post data science challenges. Um, and by the way, I, this is a photo I took. I was I happened to be lucky enough to go to this event as a graduate student um, in New York City. Um, I was just lucky. It was I was in the right place at the right right time. But um, so the data that they released in this first contest was just the the movie. Uh, it, it was the the. Uh, like an index of the user and the index of the movies that they rated and their scores, right? So it was very limited data. Um, so if you think back to the types of uh, recommender algorithms that are possible, this was a case where you could only really do collaborative filtering or, in, or interaction-based recommendation. We didn't have any information about the movies. I think there, it might have been possible that we had the actual movie identities. I can't remember for sure, but uh, I also know that certain researchers would try to recover that information but uh, it wasn't really part of the uh, intent of the contest. But the Netflix, you know, after they finished this context, the contest, they realized that that's not really how they want to do recommendation, right? They want to also consider, you know, content. They want to consider the, you know, the genre of the movie and which actors are in the movie and which, uh, who directed the movie, who the writers are, all that stuff. They want to, they want to consider that um, and they want to consider, you know, demographic information about the users. So they released a second data set for the second Netflix prize. Um, and this included anonymized information about users. Um, so what that means is they, they, you know, they mixed up the information that they provided about users and tried to make it so you couldn't figure out who was who, uh, right? So you couldn't figure out, you couldn't find yourself in the, in the data set. Even if you know you're a Netflix user, um, it, it wasn't possible for you to find yourself. Um, that was the intent anyway. Uh, and it turned out that they were not successful because, I mean, this was 10 years ago. The technology was not as good as it is today. Um, but a, a few security researchers took the data set and came up with their own challenge, right? Rather than coming up, rather than trying to solve the recommendation ta task challenge, they uh, challenged themselves to de-anonymize the data set. And they were able to find actual people in the data set uh, and then they released the paper about it, and then Netflix got in a lot of uh, uh, trouble for this. Maybe not so much, they didn't get so much get in trouble, but they, they, they didn't like what uh, what could happen if they continued to allow this contest to, to um, go on, so they canceled the contest. And so they canceled the contest, and 
this changed a lot of uh, companies' sort of view on releasing data. There was a brief moment after the first Netflix surprise where there was kind of like a, a honeymoon period between the research community and corporations where you know we would kind of imagine that other companies would be able to do things like the Netflix prize and we'd get lots of data to test our you know algorithms on to do good science with and uh, and and ever since the, the second Netflix prize has become clear that it's just not safe for the users for companies to release data even if they do take efforts to anonymize it now all that it has changed a bit with the advent of you know differential privacy methods that like the US census is using for example in 2020 but Let's just you know take this lesson. This is an important lesson that, that we had to learn as a community 10 years ago. Okay, that's an aside. Let's talk about this algorithm. So this is the algorithm. Uh, this is the paper on matrix, matrix factorization techniques. Um, and it's by Yehuda Koren and Robert Bell and Chris Walensky. And, and uh, you know, those were some of the members of the, that, that winning team uh, that I showed a picture of. Um, so the algorithm here is is this idea of matrix factorization. So what, what does that mean? So so a, a matrix, you know, some of you might know have seen matrices or matrix matrices. No matrices is the is the plural. Um, you might have seen matrices uh, in you know in school or you know in whatever. Uh, the the point is that a matrix is like a table, right? The, like, I mean, technically there's there's more to it than that, but let's just think of it as like a table of numbers. So like it's a it's a two D table. Um, and the idea we have behind matrix factorization for recommendation is to think of the ratings or the interactions that people provide as entries in the table. So, for example, we might have you know, four users, Barack, Michelle, Joe, and Jill, um, and we have four movies, uh, Paw Patrol, Forrest Gump, Jurassic Park, and Frozen. And I actually wrote this before I realized there was a Paw Patrol movie coming out either it's out now or uh, when I record this video or it's coming out soon, but I, I was just making up something. But anyway, so great. Paw Patrol is an actual example. Um, so so when, when a user provides a rating for a movie, we fill in the entry in the table, right? So, so we fill in the entry corresponding to the row. Uh, let's, say, let's say Barack rates Paw Patrol. Uh, we fill in, the, fill in the entry for the row for Barack and the column for Paw Patrol. All right, that's here. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so and then, and then you know, I jumped ahead before I was ready. So so uh, so the first entry right is, is Paw Patrol, and it happens to be in this data set. I I, I wrote that uh, Barack rated it one out of five, so he he doesn't really like Paw Patrol that much. Um, so the principle behind matrix factorization is that we want we take this matrix as as input. Right? So there's a matrix of ratings that we have, and it's going to be partially complete right? because not everyone rates every movie. Um, but we have a bunch of entries in this matrix, and the goal is to find these uh, numbers, which I'm, I'm illustrating with these like these these one uh, single column tables and single row tables, a set of numbers that re that are going to represent something about Paw Patrol and something about Barack and something about Michelle, something about Joe, something about Jill, um, and Forrest Gump and Jurassic Park and Frozen. Like these numbers are going to represent something. The, the, the thing is, we don't know what they are. Um, but the point is that we're going to line the, line up these numbers and compare them. So if uh, if we if we learn some numbers to represent Paw Patrol and we learn some numbers to represent Barack, then the way that we want to you know predict or uh, define the relationship between Barack and Paw Patrol is that we will look at their vectors together and compare them. And the the sort of the intuition behind this is that these numbers might represent something like you know uh, different genre-like aspects of the movie, as an example, right? Maybe these are the scores for how much the, uh, the movie is action, is comedy, drama, or, I mean, except in very, very rare cases, right? Like if you're casting for a movie and you need someone to play a role in a certain gender, then maybe then it might be okay. But even then, I think there's some legal issues that arise. And, and remember, this all this happens automatically, right? So, so it's not that it's not that you know anyone building the system was intending to do this. It's just that the, the system will pull out whatever information it can from the data, and if it can kind of figure out patterns that look like these protected attributes um, under our laws and and ethical standards, uh, it it might just go ahead and do that if it gets good accuracy out of it. 
So another potential thing to be aware of is that uh, when we talk about recommender systems, you know, we're often talking about you know people sort of interacting with the system, which provides data for the recommender system, and then the recommender system can then make you know learn about the people, learn about the items, and then make recommendations back to the people. Um, something to right, then this is this is like the usual story for recommender systems, but in reality the story continues and it actually you know keeps spinning around right so so. When, you, when, when the system makes recommendations to people, the people then sort of decide whether to, to accept the recommendations or not, right? They'll either watch the video or, you know, buy the product or download, um, I don't know, down, I don't know uh, download some music or something. Um, and then they, when they do that, they provide more data back to the recommender system. So what can happen is you get this feedback loop where the recommender system might start getting extra confident about its own predictions, right? Like it might it might like predict that you like a certain you know let's say let's say you were recommended this video on YouTube. Let's say you watch it. You know if you're this far in the video, you've watched it uh, quite a lot. Um, the algorithm now thinks you like machine learning uh, videos, right? So it's going to show you more of those, and those are the, that's what's going to be on your homepage when you log into YouTube. So it's going to get more, you know, you might not watch all of that, but, every, you know, if you're showing a lot of videos, you're probably going to pick, click on one of them. So you're going to start getting, giving the algorithm more feedback that you do like this thing that it showed you, that, it, you know, that it learned about you today. You know, tomorrow you'll, you'll give, it, give it more data that reinforces that belief. So it, it can turn out that people will just get, um, you know, a lot of the same thing that they, they previously looked at uh, because the recommender system gets overconfident about it. But the worst part about this is that, you know, we are not, as humans, are not constants. Like, we're, we, we are not just fixed objects. When we're shown a lot of videos about something and we watch them, it changes our opinion about things. So if, if again, working this, with this example, let's say you came across this video, you watched it, and you, you know, you, you watched it far enough that, that you, and you're learning something from it, um, you might look for more, you might be interested in machine learning, which is great. I, I'm, I would be happy if that were the case, but th that means that this video that you're watching right now changed you. Um, and this video was given to you by an algorithm. So that means that the algorithm changed you. And then not only did the algorithm change you, the algorithm, you're gonna, now going to feed more information to the algorithm um, that'll tell it that, you know, maybe you're going to get into more, more exciting, you know, more advanced machine learning videos until finally a month from now you're like a machine learning expert. That might be great for you, but, uh, you know, on the other side, someone might be, you know, seeing videos about, you know, conspiracy theories, right? And they, they click on one video because they're curious. Then the algorithm starts to think, all right, this person really likes conspiracy theory videos. And so it starts showing that person more of those videos. And... Again, like they might not like be super into conspiracy theories at first, but if they're being bombarded with recommendations to watch these videos, at some point we've all been there. At some point, you just click on it just out of curiosity, and so the algorithm then sees, oh, that person clicked on it, so we're now more confident. We should keep showing even more videos, and maybe we show more extreme videos, or maybe we show videos that are more, you know, of of away away from, you know, the mainstream. Um, and so people have talked about this as part of the problem that, that our society is facing with um, uh, extremism uh, in all directions, but also this idea of like echo chambers, but, where, but here where the algorithm is, is part of the echo chamber. It's not just like a social aspect. It's, it's, it's specifically a computer that's just messing everything up. So something to consider. Uh, it is part of the challenge in recommender systems these days. Um, not everyone's worried about the social aspect, but certainly this, the, that's there. But even this can also damage accuracy of the systems. All right, the last thing, last point I want to make is about harmful content. Um, we have to these systems. A lot of, especially social media systems, are, are now allowing you know people to generate the content. Right? It's, it's just like general users can generate the content, so the the content can be harmful sometimes. Um, so, for example like misinformation or fake or versus real news. And we've all seen, I don't, I don't mean like, well, I mean, I guess to some degree, like biased news is also part of this, but I mean like where somebody writes like a, an article about something that is completely false. Um, there's, you know, there's methods that are trying to automatically detect those. And it's a, you can think of it as a classification task, but who's gonna decide the labels? 
Um, so an example that of, of this of where this is a challenge is that in the past year, um, initially Twitter did not allow users to report COVID misinformation. Um, there's lots of things you can report on Twitter, like harassment. You can report, you know, uh, when someone is um, uh, threatening harm or something like that, right? But but for when it, when it first rolled out, it's sort of a feature that would flag a post that um, you know that information in this tweet might be unreliable about COVID. Uh, it didn't allow users to flag it because I, I, and part of it might be because they were worried that people would sort of sabotage with that feature. Um, so it's a big challenge, uh, and there's various solutions being considered. Uh, I don't, I, you know, me not being out of company, I don't know all the solutions that are people are, that people are considering. But it's a, you know, it's a big challenge. Um, and then the other thing to consider is that you know, with harmful content, it's a question of you, you know, if you have content-based or interaction-based representation, uh, you know, which one makes the makes the most sense. Um, you know, certainly you need to consider the content to consider to identify whether something's harmful, um, but you might also want to consider the interactions between people and how it's affecting people. All right, so to summarize, you know, I talked about a bunch of things, but you know, at first I gave you uh, the idea about behind two types of recommendation algorithms, and I talked about the Netflix prize and the, then the algorithm that behind the winner for the Netflix prize. Um, which, as I mentioned before, is kind of the basis for many algorithms that are still in, in use today. Um, and as I left off on that, I, I identified some potential challenges with making these algorithms behave well in our society, um, including you know, how they might pull out sensitive attributes by accident. Um, and then I also talked about how feedback loops can cause these algorithms to go awry when they interact with people. Uh, and then lastly, I, I t very briefly touched on the problem of harmful content. Um, another aspect of the harmful content is that these recommender algorithms, you know, if left without this special detection of harmful content, you know, they, they kind of want to recommend what people are most like excited about. And, and one way that you get excited about something is you get angry about it. And so a lot of times, you know, especially early on in social media, we had people like getting really angry about posts and they would fight and and then those posts would be really popular and I mean it's still kind of happening right now and so because those posts are popular they're highly recommended and so people just see more and more of this harmful um, material um, because the algorithm thinks it's good for keeping people interested uh, so think about these things uh, but they all come the all these dangers come sort of with the benefits of automatic recommendation which you know has certainly has some benefit so that's like the you know the algorithm behind it and the ideas behind it are using computers to sort of match these patterns as i mentioned in the earlier part of the video okay i i, I guess that's all i had for this topic so i hope it's interesting and you know i have some i think i have some videos I, I, certainly other people have videos on the actual deep like mathematical details behind all this stuff um, so I encourage you to check that out maybe I'll dig one of those up and put it in the description or maybe the algorithm will find it for you yeah I'll, I'll say that so I will say for the automatic caption generator um, look for videos on these uh, recommendation system algorithms and I'm sure the algorithm will find those videos for you